Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug Lontine. I'm the director of the Food Systems Spire of Excellence here at the University of Vermont and also Dean of Extension here at the University of Vermont. We want to welcome you uh, to this webinar this afternoon. Um, here at the University of Vermont, we have developed the Food System Spire, which is a transdisciplinary initiative trying to seek expertise from across the university to solve food systems related problems. And we try to strengthen the viability of our regional food systems for globally scaled issues through research, education, and outreach. Some of our prominent health, public health issues revolve around diet but it's not just our bodies that suffer from the limitations of mass food production. It is also the, the lack of time to come together at community as students as experts to make a positive impact on our food production. We have a number of programs here at the University of Vermont, a Summer Food System Summit, which brings together speakers from national and regional um, areas of expertise to share their thoughts and ideas on how to improve the community-focused food system. We also have an annual symposium here at the university that brings our faculty and staff together across the colleges and schools so we can discuss issues of importance around the food system. We also have a new master's program in food systems um, that uh, opened last year and a professional track will be opening uh, this coming fall. So with that, I would just like to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar and to the three speakers we have here. And with that, I'll turn it over to the speakers who uh, will be introducing themselves and uh, we'll get right into the, um, uh, into the conversation about sugar-sweetened beverage taxes here in Vermont. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. I'm Dr. Rachel Johnson. I'm a professor of nutrition at the University of Vermont, and I'm going to talk about the health effects of sugar-sweetened beverages. So the American Dietetic or the, the American Heart Association established a 2020 goal, which is that we that we want to lower the incidence of coronary heart disease by 20% in the American population by the year 2020. In order to achieve that, it's important that Americans reach these healthy diet goals. And one of our important diet metric is related to sugar-sweetened beverages. So the American Heart Association recommends that we consume no more than 450 calories or 36 ounces per week of sugar-sweetened beverages. In 2009, the American Heart Association put a stake in the ground by publishing a scientific statement on the, the role of added sugars in coronary heart disease. And for the first time, we established a recommendation for the amount of added sugars that can fit into a healthy diet. So for most American women, it's six teaspoons or 100 calories per day. And for men, it's 150 calories or about nine teaspoons a day. Now, added sugars are those sugars that are added during processing or preparation of foods. We're not talking about the naturally occurring sugars like fructose and fruit or lactose in milk and dairy products. Why did the American Heart Association decide to weigh in on added sugars? We felt that consumers needed a number. The DGAC is the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, and, in the, and they established the Dietary Guidelines, which form the foundation of federal nutrition policy in the U.S. In the year 2000, the committee said to moderate your intake of, added, of sugars. And then in 2005, they said choose and prepare foods and beverages with little added sugars. In 2010, they still gave no quantifiable recommendation. They said to reduce the intake of calories from added sugars. But they did say to choose water instead of sugary drinks, which was an important statement coming out of the USDA and the Department of Health and Human Services. But the AHA felt strongly that consumers needed a number. What do these words moderate, little, and reduce actually mean? So that's when we came up with our recommendation of six teaspoons a day for women and nine teaspoons a day for men. But how much sugar is America actually eating? Well, it has gone down slightly in the last few years from about 422 calories to 352 calories per person per day. And this is equal to 22 teaspoons of added sugars a day, or approximately two 
12 ounce soft drinks a day. So you can see that the consumption of sugar in the U.S. is well above the American Heart Association recommendations. Who can afford 352 calories per day of sugar in their diet? Well, my friend and colleague, Dr. Linda Van Horn, who was the chair of the 2010 Diet Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, said no adults except those who are extremely physically active, we're talking about the Michael Phelps of the world, have, the rest of us have no business consuming that many calories from sugars. Where are we getting our added sugars from in the American diet? Well, if you look at this slide, you can see that if you look at soda, energy, and sports drinks, we get about 36% of the added sugars in our diet from those beverages. If you add fruit drinks, which are a, another form of sugar-sweetened beverages, it's 46%, or almost half of our added sugars are coming from these sugar-sweetened beverages. That's followed by grain-based desserts, which is things like cakes, cookies, pies, and donuts, dairy desserts, which would be ice cream, predominantly candy, and then some ready-to-eat cereals. But by far, the majority of our, our added sugars intake are coming from these sugar-sweetened beverages. What does the science say about sugar-sweetened beverages and health? Well, I'm going to speak briefly today about the role of sugar-sweetened beverages in hypertension or high blood pressure, heart disease, and obesity. So when it comes to blood pressure, the Framingham Heart Study, which is a, a long time, uh, massive study, found that the consumption of greater than one soft drink per day significantly increased the odds of developing high blood pressure. And then in the premier study, where they actually advised people to reduce their intake of sugar-sweetened beverages in both pre-hypertensive and hypertensive adults, it was, that was associated, that reduction in the intake of sugar-sweetened beverages was associated with the reduced blood pressure. Now this looks at the role of added sugars and blood lipid levels, which are a risk factor for coronary heart disease. In this study, they used the, the, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES. They followed over 6,000 adults. They found that they were consuming a mean of 15.8%, or almost 16% of all the calories consumed were from added sugars. And in fact, we know that sugar-sweetened beverages are the number one source of calories in American diets, whether it's, um, uh, it's you know, whether it's all foods and beverages, that is the number one source of calories in our diet in America. So in this study, they found a significant correlation between added sugars and blood lipid levels in U.S. adults. This slide shows the relationship between the, the amount of energy or calories in your diet from added sugars and HDL cholesterol. Now, as many of you no, I'm sure HDL is a good cholesterol. We want our HDL cholesterol to be higher. And so in this study, you see the decline of HDL as the percent of energy from added sugars went up. And then at the same time, we saw this increase in triglyceride levels, and high levels of triglyceride are a risk factor for coronary heart disease. And we saw this increase as the percent of calories from added sugars increased. Then we get to the issue of obesity, which is a major risk factor, not only for coronary heart disease, for hypertension, stroke, as well as many cancers. And this uh, was a systematic literature review where they examined a number of studies, and they found that the evidence consistently supported the conclusion that the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages contributes to the obesity epidemic. In fact, these these scientists estimated that sugar-sweetened beverages accounted for at least one-fifth of the weight gain in the U.S. population between 1977 and 2007. Now I want to focus on two very important studies that were published this past summer in the New England Journal of Medicine, two important intervention trials. Why these are so important is because they actually did a controlled clinical trial where they, they, they actually had an intervention where they lowered the amount of sugar-sweetened beverages that the children were consuming. So this was a study done at Boston Children's Hospital with researchers from Harvard. They had 224 overweight and obese teens. They randomly assigned 
them to experimental and control groups. And the experimental group received this one-year intervention where they actually had home deliveries of bottled water and diet drinks and were encouraged to avoid the sugar-sweetened beverages. What did they find? After one year of the intervention, the intervention group gained 3.5 pounds, where the control group that had no recommendations in terms of lowering sugar-sweetened beverage consumption gained 7.7 .7 pounds, so a significant difference in the amount of weight gain in these teens, a 4.2 pound difference. Now remember, these are children, and children should gain weight as part of normal growth and development, but in this case, the control group actually gained significantly more. They stopped the intervention at year one, and at, by year two, the amount of weight gain started to converge where, they, where the intervention group started to gain a bit more because they had stopped uh, this intervention related to sugar-sweetened beverages. Then this study was done with 641 Dutch school children where they were actually randomly assigned and in school they received an eight ounce either sugar-free beverage, calorie-free sugar-free beverage, or eight ounces per day of a, of a 104 calorie sugar-sweetened beverage in an identical can. They used identical cans so they were masked in terms of the appearance of the drink. And what they found in this study was that over the 18-month 18, 18 period, the children in the sugar-free group gained an average of about 14 pounds, while those drinking the sugar-sweetened beverages gained 16 pounds. So this was a significant difference. And I love this quote uh, by the author, the lead author of this study, where she said, we found that mass replacement of a sugar-containing beverage with a sugar-free beverage significantly re reduced weight gain and body fat, in, body fat gain in the healthy children. And then she pointed out that children in the U.S. consume an average of almost three times as many calories from sugar-sweetened beverages as what they provided in their trial. So in closing, that just really builds the case, I think, for the role of sugar-sweetened beverages in obesity, in the risk factors related to heart disease, and, um, and now I'd like to move forward with my colleague, Dr. Jane Kolodinsky, who's going to talk about the economics of a proposed tax of a penny per ounce on sugar-sweetened beverages. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very pleased to be here today. I'm Jane Kolodinsky. I chair the, the Department of Community Development and Applied Economics, and I direct the Center for Rural Studies, Food Systems Research Collaborative, both at the University of Vermont. So, Aside from the, the public health questions, there are also some economic questions. And in fact, in the public policy arena, a lot of the public health questions are being reframed as economic questions when it comes to the sugar-sweetened beverage tax. So we ask the question, will a proposed penny per ounce sugar-sweetened beverage tax cause differential economic harm to small retailers due to decreased sugar-sweetened beverage demand or increases in cross-border shopping? Will small stores, including gas stations and convenience stores, be adversely and differentially impacted? And will border county residents leave the state to shop in untaxed New Hampshire to purchase their sugar-sweetened beverages? Now, the basic pre pre premise is that raising prices decreases quantity demand. Demanded, that's a basic microeconomic principle, and it's been proven over and over and over again in, in for hundreds of years. The unit of analysis is elasticity, that is the percentage decrease in quantity demanded given a 1% increase in price. So why the economic arguments against a tax? Well, first, in Vermont anyway, small retailers will lose sales critical to their profitability. Consumers will cross municipal, state, and even country borders to purchase untaxed sugar-sweetened beverages and sugar-sweetened beverage taxes will amount to lost jobs and the dislocation of existing businesses. Yet, when you look carefully at the, the published literature, there is no published data showing that this would occur. And careful examination of material pre presented by tax opponents always reveal, reveals, and I will say always reveals, hedged language could result in job loss, could cost jobs, and we have no solid data. So opponents have basically reframed the tax argument from one of public health to one of economic, negative economic impacts. So 
what does the literature say? Well, currently there is no excise tax in the U.S., so that there is no, there are no ex post examinations of how a excise sugar sweetened beverage tax will affect demand. All studies look at either price variations due to discounts, beverages being on sale, or prices charged in different retail outlets. A large seller might be able to charge lower prices than a small seller. In some states, uh, sugar sweetened beverages are, are included in items that are charged a sales tax, but if you think about that, you don't even know what the price of the item in it is until you check out at the checkout, and even then you haven't assigned the actual increase. It's just a 5% tax, let's say, on the whole order. Some studies include all beverages, including diet soda, which are not taxed, and um, milk or juice, and some studies only look at carbonated beverages, um, discounting or excluding the sports drinks, and some studies have included a variety of sugar-sweetened beverages. So, given the wide variation in data, elasticity estimates are pretty high in themselves, from slightly inelastic to highly elastic, depending on the study. And I, I really think that that's due to the fact that they include different types of sugar-sweetened beverages, perhaps not all sugar-sweetened beverages, et cetera, in the study. So, because some studies include substitute beverages, some studies don't include substitute beverages, and no study can look at an excise tax because it doesn't exist. So what did we do? Well, this was a study of Vermonters. It was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We had over 500 respondents, 88% drink sugar-sweetened beverages, about 40% purchased them. We focus on the purchasers because, after all, a parent could purchase and a child could drink the sugar-sweetened beverage, but the parent's making the decisions of whether or not to make that purchase. And we use an ex-ante experimental design. That's a before-after simulation. We ask people what they expect to do given the tax. When you do all that, we found that the only significant variable in our multivariate analysis was the tax. The tax will perform as intended. Consumers will purchase fewer sugar-sweetened beverages. So that means an 11% increase in the price of a 16-ounce sugar-sweetened beverage, costing $1.50 before and now costing $1.65, could lead to an 18% in, an 18 decrease in demand, and 22% of those might choose a non-taxed beverage or other item and a 33.5% increase in the price of a $2.00 2-liter bottle, that would be to 267, could lead to an 81% decrease in demand. Now, you might say that that's an awfully big decrease in demand, but when you don't buy the 64 or 2-liter or bottle, you're actually automatically decreasing your consumption by 67 ounces. Um, as an aside, we're in the field right now where we're asking people this time whether or not they would switch to a smaller size, seeing that that might become an option in the future. So what does that mean? If people switch to a non-taxed beverage, it, we estimated that would be four ounces a week less, or 2,500 calories, or up to a three quarters of a pound. That would be like going from a 16 ounce container to a 12 ounce container of sugar sweetened beverage. And if people opted out of, bev opted out of a beverage, that would be about 10 ounces a week less, it's like going from a 16-ounce container to just under an 8-ounce can. They might uh, lose 6,240 calories a year or up to 1 and 3 quarters pounds. So what does that mean? That's nothing, a pound and 3 quarters. The average adult is going to add 10 to 20 pounds over the next 10 years of their life. I believe that those are the estimates. Substituting a non-tax beverage takes care of seven of them. If you look at this graph, these are pounds of fat. So uh, it would be five six, seven, and not substituting or not drinking those sugar-sweetened beverages will take care of 18 of the 20 pounds. There you go, three times five is 15, 16, 17, 18. That's a lot of fat. Bottom line, a sugar-sweetened beverage tax is a policy option that can nudge consumers to make beverage choices that contain fewer calories compared to sugar-sweetened beverages and can be part of a policy package that begins to put a dent in our obesity epidemic. We found no indication that the sugar-sweetened beverage tax would force people to go travel over the border to purchase their sugar-sweetened beverages, and we found no economic harm to small stores because people would not be flocking away. They would, a majority of them would choose an alternative non-taxed sugar-sweetened beverage. Thank you, and I'll take questions at the end, and I'd like to turn it over to Tina.
Thanks. I'm Tina Zook, and I'm the Government Relations Director in Vermont for the American Heart Association. And we're supporting a penny per ounce excise tax on sugar sweetened beverages. And when I say we, the Cancer Society has been a great partner with us, and so has the Alliance for a Healthy Vermont, which now represents 38 different organizations who are supporting this effort. So our, our legislation this time around is H234. You can find it just by Googling the Vermont legislature and then looking at the bills and getting the actual te text of the bill. And I will talk about some of what it does. So our legislation that's been introduced imposes a penny per ounce excise tax on sugar sweetened beverages. And so as Jane noted earlier, the difference between a sales tax and an excise tax is we want people to see on the shelf the difference in price so they can make the decision on what to purchase right there at the shelf. When it's a sales tax, they don't see it until it's on their receipt, and it does nothing to change their purchasing behavior. So in our legislation in Vermont, half of the funds raised from the revenues from the, from the FSB tax would go to the State Health Care Resources Fund. Currently, that fund helps to fund Medicaid, Catamount, and VHAP in Vermont. And under the bill, half the funds would also go to a new fund called the Vermont Healthy Weight Initiative Fund and could only be used to do the following. So it would create a permanent obesity prevention fund very similar to what Vermont has done with its tobacco control program, working in schools, um, in the community, and um, education and media. This fund would also subsidize school meals and the purchase of fresh fruits and vegetables by WIC and Three Squares Vermont, which is our food stamps program. So while it is making one product, one food product, if you want to call it a food, um, more expensive, it would make some healthier choices less expensive. It would provide EBT terminals at farmers markets, and it would provide loans for small retailers to purchase refrigeration equipment to start displaying healthier food choices. And our legislation would also require an evaluation of the tax, and um, that's a make it or break it for both the American Heart Association and the Cancer Society. We do want to answer questions as to whether or not this would um, make uh, consumers choose differently. So our legislation would tax soda, it would tax sweetened iced teas and coffees, it would tax sports drinks, all if they had added sugars, energy drinks, fruit juices or drinks with added sugar and flavored water, and it would also tax powdered drink mixes. The way the legislation is currently written, it would not tax 100% fruit juices, it wouldn't tax diet sodas or beverages with non-calorie sweeteners, and the magic number is if they had five calories or under per serving, and that would not be taxed. It wouldn't tax milk-based products. We, we don't want to discourage kids, um, especially from drinking milk with some of the nutrients that they need. It would not um, tax infant formula, and it would not tax alcohol. Now, this is the second time we've had um, a bill proposed to have an SSB tax in Vermont. Last year, it did exempt um, products flavored with maple syrup. Um, it's not in the legislation this year, I think mainly as an oversight, um, when, and I'll get into this later, but when the House Health Care Committee recently included the tax legislation in a broader health care funding bill, they did exempt both maple syrup and honey from um, the items that could be taxed. So what's new this time? As I mentioned before, we introduced the tax, the same tax two years ago, and the legislation is almost identical. But what's new this time around is this time around, we have the support for Vermont's Low Income Advocacy Council, which is the, base, the biggest organization in the state representing the low income community, which has been great because one of the arguments we'll hear from the opposition, whether it's true or not, is this is a regressive tax and it's going to hurt those who can least afford to pay. Um, what we're saying is those folks are disproportionately paying from the ills that are caused from obesity and sugar-sweetened beverages. It's an inexpensive product, and they are more of those folks are suffering from heart disease, stroke, and cancer. So it's been great to have the Low Income Advocacy Council on board. All of Vermont's hospitals are now on board the tax initiative, and four of the major hospitals took action internally on FSBs, Fletcher Allen Healthcare has reduced um, the sales of sugar-sweetened beverages. Gifford Hospital has uh, eliminated it completely, Dartmouth too, and um, Northwestern Medical Center has reduced the sale of sugar-sweetened beverages that's on campus because they see the harms in them. And we've had a great partnership with Fletcher Allen and UVM and the medical school this year, really coming out strongly in favor of this tax as a way of addressing rising health care costs associated to obesity. Another um, new thing this year that's making this bill kind of um, move a little bit better than last time is that we have the support of the ranking member of the House Ways and Means, um, Dave Sharp, 
who's on board, which is great um, because it's being looked at as both as both a healthcare issue and a, a revenue issue in terms of dealing with healthcare costs. And this year in Vermont, there's concern over funding for healthcare for low to middle income Vermonters. So one of the things that's been working alongside the um, initiative to implement this tax is that we have two programs that subsidize healthcare for low income Vermonters called CATAMOUT and VHAP, and they will both be going away next year when our health benefit exchange rolls out. And as it stands now, those folks will face significantly higher premiums and out-of-pocket costs, and there's a good contingency of the legislature who do not want to see that happen. So what's not new this time around? Um, Governor Shumlin, who's the gentleman in the picture there, opposes the tax. He opposed it the last time around, and that's one of the reasons the tax did not move during the last session. He was a new governor. Um, the Democrats were cautious about uh, promoting anything that he had already weighed in against. Um, he's had two years under his belt, so we're hoping this year will make a difference. But another thing that's not new, as you can see, there's an ad there, and I wish I could um, show it for how big it really was. The beverage industry is pouring money into fighting this um, effort, and you'll see the ad there is a full-page ad they ran a week ago against the tax. And um, I don't know if you can see it if I hold it up here. Just today, they have another full-page ad um, against the tax, and what's you know disheartening is it's spun in a way that um, doesn't do um, justice to what the tax is really trying to do. Obviously, it's a tax on sugary drinks. And if you'll note in the ad, ad it says stop the Vermont beverage tax and that Vermonters will pay more for groceries. And the ad today emphasizes the same, same thing, that it's really going to be a hit to your groceries. Um, it doesn't mention at all the, the sugar um, and the harm that it causes. So some of the key facts that we've been trying to provide legislators as we move ahead is, is facts that we know are true and how this is impacting the health of Vermonters. And in Vermont right now, 58% of our adults are either overweight or obese, and, and about a quarter of our kids are as well. And, half, and so from an expense point of view, half of Vermont's Medicare and Medicaid expenses, $163 million a year currently are attributed to obesity. And then there's another $187 million in lost productivity on top of that. And um, as Rachel said earlier, sugar sweetened beverage consumption has more than doubled over the last 30 years, and the average American now drinks 45 gallons annually. And that's on average. There are many people who drink far more than that, including our kids, who can drink up to 108 gallons a year um, for, for um, male teenagers, just the largest group. And SSBs account for at least a fifth of the weight gain between 1997 and 2007 in the U.S. population. And this makes a difference to uh, legislators who are concerned about rising health care costs. Other, other key facts that we've been promoting along with this tax is that studies have shown, um, as Rachel mentioned earlier, and Jane, the price of sugar-sweetened beverages could, um, if you increase the price of sugar-sweetened beverages, you could get people to drink less of them, especially kids who are price sensitive. And this is a big one. The calories that we can, and it's, a, it's sort of a harder sell just because I don't think many people are aware of the differences between junk foods and the calories in junk foods. But then the calories we consume in liquid form are considerably less filling than the calories we consume in solid foods. In solid foods. The calories we drink can add to those we eat rather than replace them. A really good example to um, provide uh, decision makers that you're talking to is, you may have a Coke and a Snickers bar. You may have a Coke and a bag of potato chips. You may have a Mountain Dew and a donut. You're not likely to have that donut with the Snickers bar. It's different. You're going to get full and not want the, the second item. So in Vermont, the um, Red Center for P Food Policy at Yale University found we would raise about $27 million a year in revenues from a penny per ounce excise tax in Vermont. The state's joint fiscal, fiscal office used the same um, calculations that Rudd used and came up with a, a similar amount. It's around $24, $25 million that we would raise in Vermont. And I think the bottom, um, the bottom bullet that you see here, revenues from an SSB tax could be used to provide greater access to health care and fund anti-obesity initiatives and in education in Vermont is one of your biggest selling points. One of the things that we've heard in Vermont is, that the business industry, the grocers, and the um, big beverage will say, you're not going to see the impact that you hope to see because we'll just spread the price of the tax across all beverages. And I think if you're using the, the funding from this for obesity initiatives, no matter what consumers do, you are still addressing obesity with, with that funding. 
So none of these will probably be a surprise to anyone on the webinar today, but these are some of the arguments that we've heard from the opposition in Vermont. Uh, the first one is one that I just mentioned. An SSB tax won't reduce consumption or obesity. It'll be spread across all beverages. Another is an SSB tax will hurt Vermont businesses and cause shoppers to go to New Hampshire. We have information um, that shows the contrary. Um, both um, in Jane's study and uh, Dr. Chaluka addressed this as well when he testified last week, and that's coming up. I'll address that in a minute. And so we heard as well that the tax is regressive and will hurt low-income Vermonters. And as I mentioned, the state's largest low-income advocacy group is supporting the tax. So they better than anyone should know whether it's regressive. One of the reasons they like our, our tax and our legislation is because it would hopefully discourage people from consuming these beverages that are dangerous to their health. But it also provides funding for them for health care. And it also provides funding to make costly, healthy foods less expensive. So they see it more as a progressive tax. And similarly, um, when we tried to pass the cigarette tax a few years ago in Vermont, the state's joint fiscal office actually said that in the case of the tobacco tax, it could be considered progressive if the funds were used um, for things that help the low-income community. So we see that very similar here. Another one of the big um, opposition arguments that we've heard is if we start taxing sugary drinks, uh, it's a slippery slope and all junk foods are going to be taxed next. And, and that's not the case. We found that with, um, with the sugary drinks, people were more price responsive than they are with some of the solid junk foods and also the issue of it not making you full and contributing majorly um, to the extra calories and added sugars in your diet. Another major argument that we've heard both from the opposition and from the governor is that obesity can be solved with education and not a tax on sugary drinks. And as we have found um, in the past with tobacco, education alone isn't enough. It's the increase in price with a public education campaign that has helped with tobacco. And that um, the CDC's health impact pyramid will show that education really is not uh, super effective on its own that it's more effective tied with other things and um, things like uh, you'll see the, the bigger portion of the pyramid are things like increasing taxes like tobacco. And the last one we hear is that it's, this is a nanny state argument. The government shouldn't be telling us what to do. And we would make the case that um, there are certain uh, public policy initiatives where the governor feels that the danger warrants taking action. Smoke-free bars and restaurants, seat belts, um, lead testing, that and also, you know, the case that Vermont is paying millions of dollars in health care as a result of obesity, we feel, is a reason the government should take action. So some of what we used to support our case is we did see with cigarette taxes that when we increased the price of tobacco, consumption did drop. We don't necessarily know that that's definitely going to be the case with SSBs, but we are um, looking at past history with tobacco. We're hoping it would be the same. And one of the things we heard about cross-border revenues, you'll see in this chart, that every single time we increased our cigarette tax, we had higher revenues for the state of Vermont. On July 1, 2006, this answers the border issue for states who are concerned about it in the same way Vermont is. In July 2006, Vermont cigarette tax increased from $1.19 to $1.79 a pack. And that compared to New Hampshire's tax, which was only 80 cents a pack at the time. And so we had a whole year to kind of look at what happened after that tax. And in the year following the increase, cigarette tax revenues rose in Vermont by $13.4 million, or a 28% increase, while cigarette tax revenues in New Hampshire fell by $3.4 million, or a decrease of 2.4%. So based on the history with the cigarette tax, there's no reason to believe that the same wouldn't be true with sugar sweetened beverage tax. So our strategy in Vermont, we've relied on a, a lot of different ways to move it ahead. We've, we've tried every tool that we have in our, in our toolbox, I guess. Um, we've relied very heavily on earned media. Unlike the beverage industry, we don't have the money for uh, full-page ads. So we have um, taken, and I would encourage everybody to take advantage of every opportunity you have to get some earned media. Um, late last fall, early winter, UVM, um, held a panel presentation uh, highlighting some of the things we were talking about today. They talked about the, um, the impact on college students, whether or not people would cross borders, the health dangers. And that really was, I think, sort of the unofficial launching of this effort in Vermont because we invited all the media to come. And it got some good play out there. And we got the first say on the tax this session. It was right before the legislature started. Um, we held a press conference linking the sugar sweetened beverage tax with health care funding. As I mentioned, 
one of the things that's happening in Vermont is we have these low-income Vermonters who are cur currently getting um, quality health care at a reasonable price. And when they go into the exchange, while some will go to Medicaid, a lot will now have high out-of-pocket costs and pre premiums. And there's a, a, a big group of people in Vermont who don't want to see Vermont going backwards in health care reform. So we had a letter that was signed we, um, to the governor, and 108 physicians signed that, and we released that at our press conference. We also had petitions from hundreds of Vermonters who also said, look, you can't go backwards in health care reform, and we see the sugar sweet and beverage tax is a great way to help us with that effort. And as I mentioned earlier, we had low-income support and hospital support. So uh, from the medical community showing the science of why this should be addressed and the low-income folks, the people that um, some of the opponents were pointing to as the people who would be most negatively impacted. And we made the case that they would, they would benefit the most from a tax like this as they drank fewer of the products and um, suffered fewer of the harms from obesity. So we also aggressively recruited sponsors this year um, for the legislation, and I believe we have around 35 sponsors that were on board when the legislation was introduced. We uh, have really ramped up the grassroots to build um, organizational support, individual support, and really getting physicians on board, I think, was um, significantly helpful in Vermont. And we um, did a lot of outreach to other organizations, and as I mentioned, we have 38 organizations to date, and they really are a who's who of public health in Vermont. Um, we have done some polling as well um, through Robert Wood Johnson and independently, and we'll release some polling information soon on um, some, of the, some of the key issues that we've talked about, you know, cross-border concerns, whether people think they've reduced their consumption. And just this week, we started some paid media and phone banking. As I mentioned, the industry poured in um, money in the state to do full-page ads in all of the state's uh, daily papers. And you'll see there's the ad again that ran previously. Um, and this, you know, this really speaks to what's been happening all across the country, why there perhaps isn't an excess tax yet. Um, beverage companies spent $948 million in 2010 to advertise sugary drinks and energy drinks in all measured media an increase of 5% since 2008. And this is just on advertising the sugary drinks. This isn't counting the, the, the ad that you see there or the ad that um, they ran today, full page ads, trying to fight this tax. So this is an ad we ran just, um, there's a political kind of online news site that all of the legislators and decision makers uh, read in Vermont, including the governor, and we ran this ad just starting last week. Is the future of Vermont worth a few pennies? A penny per ounce tax on sugar sweetened beverages is an alternative to raising other taxes, a positive step in the fight against obesity, especially in kids, and a way to preserve programs for the poor. And this is a banner ad that pops up when people see other news reports on that online news service. We've been working in Vermont to do some message testing and some focus groups with people on the SSB tax, so we're really trying to find out what makes people tick and what might cause them to uh, support a tax or take action on a tax. And we're not finished yet, but we really wanted to um, get to the heart of what might make people act on this issue. And you'll see this picture here. The Heart Association is part of the Alliance for a Healthier Vermont. That's our 38 organization group that's supporting this tax. And we have these posters made to show how much sugar is in your drink because we wanted to get people to realize just how much is in these beverages and why we're talking about this issue. And these posters have been requested by hundreds and hundreds of physicians and dentist offices across Vermont. So we've captured within the Alliance all those organizations who've requested those posters because obviously they care about um, the issue and we've kept them abreast of what's been going on. And we've been trying to get some good earned media because we don't have the resources to spend on the paid ads. Um, two of our best editorials so far, and I encourage you to Google them because they're wonderful. The Rutland Herald is the second largest daily in the state, and they wrote um, an editorial in December called The Sweet Deal. And they were amazed to find out that a third of all cancer deaths in Vermont are linked to obesity. They totally got why the Heart Association was on board, but it kind of was news to them that cancer is also caused by obesity and sugar-sweetened beverages. And so they endorsed the sugar-sweetened beverage tax as a way to go both in reducing obesity and funding health care in Vermont. And the Brattleboro Reformer just came out with an um, editorial this past week um, also supporting the sugar sweetened beverage tax as a way to address rising health care costs and to fund health care for those who really need it. And we also wrote op-eds and letter to, letters to the editors on our side. The president of the, um, the Vermont Board of the American Heart Association responded to uh, a not great 
um, editorial in the Burlington Free Press noting that they missed the chance to say, look, just because we can't solve, completely solve the problem with an FSB tax, we can certainly make a first step forward with it and have the resources available to try to address this. Um, and the chief medical officer at the state's largest hospital, Fletcher Allen Healthcare, also wrote a wonderful um, editorial for the um, hospital on its blog, uh, which we're promoting further as well. And I can't say enough what um, the message coming from physicians um, to legislators. So this slide is just a tiny bit out of date, actually, because we had some action that you probably have heard about on Friday. But what's happening now in Vermont, the House Health Care Committee took a number of weeks of testimony on this bill. Um, well, the issue in general, I should say, not necessarily the bill. They wanted to know why we should address this more from the um, health reasoning than economic reasoning, because that's their jurisdiction. And they heard, they had at least four or five hearings on the issue, and they said they wanted to give the opportunity to everyone who wanted to say. So they heard from the health advocates, um, physicians, economists, um, and the industry themselves. And um, what happened is they had a vote last week on whether or not they have a separate measure on, that would fund health care. And, and that's for those folks that I mentioned, the low-income Vermonters who are moving to the exchange. They want to do something to address those out-of-pocket costs. So they voted whether or not we should include the FSB tax legislation in that broader health care funding bill. And the committee voted 7 to 2. Yes, they wanted to do that. So they did include the tax legislation in that broader health care funding bill. What happened on Friday, and you may have all heard on the list there that the FSB tax is dead in Vermont. It's not. What happened was the committee voted 5 to 5 against that health care funding bill that did include the FSB tax. So they didn't come out and vote per se rate against the tax that it was a bad thing. Five members voted for the broader health care uh, funding bill that included the FB tax, and five voted against it. Um, of the three that voted against it, three were conservatives who didn't like the SSB tax. Two were actually a progressive and independent who voted against it not because they didn't like the SSB tax, but they wanted more funding to go to health care. So we're not sure yet exactly what that means. Tomorrow is another day. The committee's going to meet again. So it's, there is a possibility that that bill in itself could be reconsidered. But we're going to just continue as we have been pushing this issue as a priority for Vermont to address the obesity crisis. Um, the tax itself could be uh, addressed in many other ways. It could be addressed through ways and means as a revenue measure. It could be addressed in the Senate. It could be attached in the miscellaneous tax bill at the end of the session. So uh, the issue is far from over in Vermont. And we really see it that way if, um, if it was over. I, I, I don't think that the industry would still be uh, putting full-page ads out in opposition to it, and um, so we're still working hard on that. And um, that's my that's my um, presentation for now. We do have um, information about the tax and Vermont's efforts on the Alliance for a Healthier Vermont. And you'll see that website right there. Um, and then I think we're all all three of us are happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. We do have some questions from the participants. And if anyone else has additional questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box there and we'll address them. We have sorted them by topic area, so I'm going to read them aloud. Um, the, an early question about the survey is, um, where is the SSB survey published? Right now it's um, under review in the referee literature in the, um, in the journal Appetite. Uh, to determine um, wh what types of sugars this would address, are we talking about high fructose corn syrup, lactose, maltose, fructose, agave, honey? Does it include beverages sweetened with honey or maple syrup only? Right, so it, it includes any added sugars. So if it's 100% fruit juice, it would not be taxed. But if sugars or added juices have been added to the product, that would be taxed. Currently, as the legislation stands now, it would include a tax if they were flavored with honey and maple syrup. As I mentioned, the health care committee's language that they included in their, health, in their broader health care funding piece did not tax um, beverages that were flavored with um, real Vermont maple wall, real maple syrup. We, we prefer Vermont. Um, <laughs> or honey, but that's not the way the legislation currently is written. So just to reiterate what I said earlier, it does not include the naturally occurring sugars, lactose in milk and dairy products, or fructose in fruit, so 100% fruit juice. But any other added sugar, whether it's high fructose corn syrup or cane sugar, any other form of added sugars would be, would be included. 
Given the detrimental health effects of calorie-free sweeteners, should a tax not be levied on these as well? Are you concerned that this may send a message that diet sodas are a healthy alternative to soda? Recent studies by the American Diabetes Association have shown that drinking soda, diet soda, correlates positively with weight gain. Yes. Sure. I'm going to try that from a consumer perspective, and then I'll let the health person, um, the health person answer. You know, this, this bill is really aimed at the calories in sugar, so a diet beverage with no calories, it's not really the aim. However, I heard an interesting argument after I testified last week that that retailers usually price things in blocks, and they're going to spread this tax over a variety of, of products, and carbonated sodas would be a block. And so I would think that you'd garner more support for the tax if indeed the tax were spread over carbonated sugar sweetened um, sodas and their diet alternative, and that would address this problem. So I, yeah. that's the way I've been thinking about it. I think from a health perspective, last summer the American Heart Association, we published a scientific statement on, we call them non-nutritive sweeteners, or some people call them artificial sweeteners, and health. And we did not find any adverse health effects of the non-nutritive sweeteners. They are approved by the FDA. They've been in the food supply for decades. Uh, and and I, my personal view is that a diet beverage can be a great transition beverage if you're trying to move away from sugar-sweetened beverages. Many of the studies that show an association between diet beverages and weight are cross-sectional studies. We know that people who have a higher BMI or, or way more tend to drink more of the diet beverages. Now, does that mean that that's causing them to be fat? No, that means that they're using the diet beverages perhaps as a tool to help to keep themselves from gaining more weight or maybe they're trying to lose weight, but it's not a cause and effect relationship. Some people have submitted some comments online. I'd like to ask that if you submitted a comment but haven't phrased it as a question, if you can please rephrase it as a question for our speakers, that would be very helpful. This, uh, we have a few questions about the consumption, the decline in consumption. Consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages has declined more than 12% since 1999 in calories in the American diet from added sugars in soda are down 39% since 2000 according to NHANES data cited in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So why aren't we having a more comprehensive discussion about how to address obesity? I think we actually are. It's, it's true that it says soda. Soda is a carbonated beverage and one of a class that has totally had brand extensions. And perhaps the, the drinking of soda specifically, carbonated sodas, has declined. Yet now we're seeing this extension into all kinds of sports drinks and energy drinks and, and other drinks that are included in a sugar-sweetened beverage bill. So I believe it is a little more comprehensive than just the soda tax. And we actually are making progress on obesity in, in some areas of the country, particularly among children. But I read a great quote that said, this isn't happening in places where people, where we're just wringing our hands and wondering what to do. It's happening. We're seeing this at least leveling off, if not a very, very slight decline in the prevalence of obesity in communities and areas of the country where they are aggressively targeting and trying to do something about the obesity epidemic. Why doesn't your proposal include a tax on alcohol? The CDC reported last year that adults consume 100 calories a day on average from alcoholic beverages. I think one of the reasons it doesn't is we're trying to address um, obesity in children and we know that from the studies we've seen so far that people will drink less of the sugary drinks. I don't know if alcohol has been part of those studies, but so if we want to address obesity in children, alcohol isn't playing a role. How does taxing soda help reduce obesity if people are substituting soda calories for other calories, whether from milk, chocolate milk, flavored soy milk, which has sugar, juice, etc.? You know, we actually asked people uh, what they would do, and 50% um, of, of our respondents said they would continue to buy the sugar sweetened beverage, 22% would substitute it to another beverage, and about a quarter said they would purchase nothing. Of those people who purchased nothing, they would be getting zero calories. Of the 22% that switched, 
the majority of those said they would switch to water, which again is no calories. About 7% said they would switch to the diet alternative, which again are much less calories. What's happening to the other 14%, we can't really say, but they said they would switch to things like coffee if they took it black, which you think some people might. They would have fewer calories. If they took it with cream, maybe they would have the same or more calories. We really can't say. But overall, it appears that overall and on average, the number of calories will decrease based on what, um, what people said they would switch to or they would switch to nothing. And I would love to see our children consuming less sugar-sweetened beverages and more milk. I would applaud that. We know that 9 out of 10 teenage girls and 7 out of 10 teenage boys don't meet their calcium requirements. We have a serious shortfall of calcium, vitamin D, potassium, and magnesium, all of which milk and dairy products are a rich source of. And I'm very concerned about the bone health of our children who are growing up consuming all these sugar-sweetened beverages and are not receiving these shortfall nutrients that milk is a rich source of. So I would love to see that curve of increased sugar-sweetened beverage consumption and declining milk consumption do a turnaround. <laughs> In that, and those studies have shown that in the 1990s, it was the first time that our kids started drinking more of sugar-sweetened beverages and, as Rachel said, and less of milk that it, it kind of crossed paths in a sad way. And we're hoping this would, you know, start maybe getting that, the milk to go back up again. This is a question about your survey again, Jane. What results has your polling yielded locally? 59% of Americans oppose an SSB tax according to an AP poll. It was about 50-50, and that's what makes it such a difficult issue, I believe. 50% were for and 50% were against. But I have to tell you that the tails, the strongly opposed and strongly support, were much smaller than, um, had much smaller responses than the opposed and um, support. So that it seems like there might be a way to get people to, to uh, come into the middle. This person is interested in the translatability of your findings to other states, in particular in light of the recent and failed beverage tax proposal in Richmond, California. I assume that means Virginia, actually. No, no it's California. 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 And who is that? Tra I don't think to you. you. Can you translate your, your study, survey your study. results to oh, other, other um, contacts? Well, you know, it's very interesting that um, our survey results specifically for Vermont were within the, the um, same findings as nationally based surveys that used scanner data nationally that didn't even have anything to do with sugar-sweetened beverages. So um, I would say go do some local polling, use some statistically valid results, and just keep hitting them with the facts. Um, and, and that's all you can do because I think in the end, that real data um, trump people's opinions. And anything other than a statistically valid study is just an anecdote. Why not make the healthier options cheaper? We are doing that with the, um, we are doing that to some extent with the Vermont legislation. We are trying to decrease the price of fresh fruits and vegetables um, with this legislation. So we are making things like sodas and sugar added juices more expensive, but um, vegetables and fruits uh, prices we would be lowering. And it's interesting that that uh, that question was brought up because that has been successfully done. I know in Minnesota they did it in schools where they actually lowered the price of healthy foods and increased the price of foods that were less uh, nutrient dense or less nutrient rich, and, and it actually had the effect of the children were purchasing more of the healthy food. So it is a strategy that's been done and can work. And I, I think in some Scandinavian countries they um, have tried the same kinds of policies. And I don't think any one of us is saying that this is the magic bullet solution to all the health problems in the United States, but it's one piece of a policy package that could help to, to make a dent. Here's another question for Jean. Today in the free press, there was an ad from the Beverage Association that says the price of an SSB could go up 50% from the tax. Under what scenario could that happen? You know, I didn't know either until Tina um, showed me on the ad that, that the containers of powders will be taxed as well. And if it's a penny per ounce, and um, here in the ad, it's a country time lemonade powdered mixed drink, 
And so that might make gallons and gallons and gallons, which are many, many ounces, and therefore the tax could go way up. But looking at this um, photograph of all of the beverages that are included in uh, the there's no room in Vermont for a beverage tax, those sugar-sweetened um, powdered mixes are one out of probably 20 um, that are on there. So I think that that's probably the one. With, right, yeah. Tina? Yeah. And, you know, I think a point to bring up here, too, is that we want people to feel the increase. Uh, if the increase isn't substantial, it's not going to be in a disincentive. So we do want people to feel it's a penny per ounce. So, you know, 12 ounce can, you're going to be paying an extra 12 cents, 16 ounce, 16 cents, 64 ounce, 64 cents. So we do want people to feel that difference so that they will make a healthier choice. This is for Rachel. The clinical studies cited do not include a true control, that is, non-sweetened beverage, in that their treatment groups are all given a sweetened beverage. Are there studies that in include a true control, or is this yet to be undertaken? Well, the two studies that I talked about that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine last summer did, in fact, have true controls. The study that was conducted in Boston, they had the home delivery of water or no-calorie beverages. And so in that, in that study, the intervention was they provided the low or no-calorie beverage, and then with the uh, control group, they didn't change their normal uh, then they just got regular care. And then the study that was done with the children um, in Denmark, they actually provided either a calorie containing, it was 104 calories per eight ounce beverage, with a uh, non-caloric beverage. They were in identical cans. And so in that, in that case, the, the you know, it, it, it had the two arms of the study where the one group of children got the calorie-containing sugar-sweetened beverage and the other got the non-caloric beverage. So those two studies were, um, were very important studies because, as I said, they are randomized controlled clinical trials, which are the gold standard in terms of proving cause and effect, not just association. Can, can we go back to the... Um, 50% can pay almost more than 50% question. You know, in the end, um, by the time you make the, the drink, and in fact, it doesn't matter what the size of the beverage is, it's still a penny per ounce, whether it's a 64 ounce size, whether it's a 12 ounce size, whether it's the 10 gallon size. The, the tax is still, it's no more than a penny an ounce. Right. Of, of the prepared, of the prepared, right, yeah. <laughs> so you add water to a powder and it takes two tablespoons of the powder or whatever to make eight ounces, it would be eight cents on two tablespoons, I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We're getting very close to our time, so this will have to be the last question um, that we address today. But the contact information for our speakers is on the screen there, and they are happy to follow up with any questions you might have afterwards. Uh, this is about the legislative process in Vermont. If the SSB tax passes, can the opposition collect signatures and refer it to the ballot? No, we don't have a referendum in Vermont. Great. Okay. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for attending. And as I mentioned, the presenters will be able to address your questions offline if you have any additional questions. And thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. all.